of Tessa Gianni. That person then disappeared for seven to eight months. I think a really great way to tell if somebody might have gotten sucked into something that has taken hold of them and they're not aware of of what's happened is somebody who posts a, a YouTube video titled Five Signs You're Not Being Your Authentic Self and then seven months uh, or eight months later returns to YouTube with a different name, different style, a different personality, and a different hair color. And I guess, you know, if I were to add a fifth thing, joining a cult would be at the top of the list. So what concerns me about this is I think Teresa is a great example of sort of what's happening to many individuals who are, are becoming uh, enamored with the Corey Good story. Uh, there is a celebration of having all of the answers. There is a feeling of being on a, uh, a track towards secret truths with secret truths being revealed. There's a tendency to accept pretty much uh, whatever uh, is presented to you as truth. And, you know, I'll give a great example. Teresa uploaded some videos uh, when she went to the eSETI conference. And I have three separate people from that conference talking about how, like, they, like, totally tripped out, man, while they were sitting in a field gazing off towards Mount Adams. Trip on this, right? There's hundreds of people here right now. And last night we saw all kinds of crazy things. Now, but I did see this this gray smudge orb thing. Well, you, we all saw it last night. But it was about 50 feet in diameter. It was kind of flat, like the orbs you see in photographs. But it was giant, right? And I'm sitting back there in the chairs with everybody. It's about 11 o'clock last night. But if you look here... And you see the break in the trees right there. It came out of there in a curve, a curve like this, gray orb, right? Right there. And so I'm sitting in the trees and I, and I see this, it goes on for about five seconds. And I'm watching it and I'm thinking, that is a trip, there's a gray orb. And then somebody sitting behind me goes, is anybody watching that gray orb? And I spin around, I'm like, it's it's real it's not my imagination because i was tripping and well they were totally tripped out dude they saw what they thought might have been alien spacecraft flying around uh passing overhead but when you're tripping out who knows what that looks like and um i think what you'll find is that the cory good marketing uh campaign uh, the thrust of it is geared towards kind of exploratory young demographic that's desperately in search of meaning, exploring uh, altered states of consciousness uh, into veganism. That's sort of where all of his messages has kind of been projected. And you can see it working uh, as people who are already inclined towards that way of being very, very much seem to be flocking uh, towards the, the Corey Good story. Now, when Teresa uploaded a video talking about the, all of the spacecraft that she had seen and how many of the people at ESETI had watched in amazement as a giant door had opened on the side of Mount Adams, uh, which they immediately uh, believed was a door and was not only a door, but a door that had been opened by the inner earth on Shar uh, to kind of wave hello at all of them as they tripped out in a field to indicate that, yes, they know they're there and yes, they're all together uh, in solidarity. Now, I, I made a very straightforward comment regarding that upload in the comment section. I simply said that I looked forward to all of the, the video footage of the spacecraft from ESETI and that I also looked forward to the exploration of the, of the giant door in the side of the mountain and, you know, asked when that might be made available and, and said thank you. Now, the response I got was very defensive. I was accused of uh, having posted a comment that was dripping with sarcasm. And I can say that, you know, it might have had a few dabs of sarcasm in it, but uh, the questions were um, sincere. Uh, if you're going to go on YouTube as a representative of the Sphere Being Alliance and Corey Good movement, 
um, and claim to be seeing spacecraft flying around uh, Mount Adams and giant doors opening on the side of the mountain, it's probably a good idea to come with some actual evidence of that rather than simply recounting what people experienced the night before as they were tripping out while showing video of what appears to be a, a shadow on the side of the mountain cast by sunlight. Now, we had a back and forth over email. Uh, Teresa admonished me for not having simply gone on to Google and done a Google search of UFO sightings around Mount Adams and supplied me with a link to one such video, which I took a look at and immediately discerned to be a mistake, not perhaps not necessarily a hoax. People can make mistakes. You know, they can still operate a camera, uh, but maybe they're not seeing what they think they're seeing. Uh, or it could have been a hoax, but it was obviously fake and, and not a UFO. I forwarded it to uh, Kyle, UFO proof, who has a much uh, more detailed analysis. And I pointed this out to Teresa, that this was not real. And her response was that it was simply one example of what could be found on Google and that I could go on to Google and, and, and find additional examples. Now, I think we all know that we can all go on to Google and find a lot of examples of hoax UFO videos. Um, I don't think that's the point that we're trying to get to here. I think the point is that if you, for people who really want to find out what's actually going on, whatever that is, with the UFO phenomenon, that it's so important to demand evidence, to be skeptical, and, and to really challenge people who make claims uh, without evidence. And now we come to what I feel is one of the strongest pieces of evidence suggesting that the entire story from Corey is a fabrication. And that is a, a long interview with uh, Corey Good's wife, Stacy Good. And it was conducted by Teresa Yanaros of the Divine Frequency uh, YouTube channel, who I have previously mentioned. So when you watch this interview, and we'll put the link in the description below, Corey Good's wife, through all of this, through all of these things that have happened, has not had a single direct experience with anything res even resembling remotely evidence that uh, that Corey's story is true. And, you know, I, I know a lot of people want to search for signs of corroboration and, and correlation to, to, to bolster Corey's story. And you would think an interview with his wife would be the place where that would happen. And in fact, the opposite occurs. So every single piece of supposed corroborating evidence that she uh, states is something that she actually has no direct memory of, but which is something that Corey tells her has occurred to her prior to her memory being wiped. So every major interaction with an alien being, abductions, you know, pretty much everything that uh, Corey's wife claims has happened to her, all of this information has been relayed to her and to her solely by Corey Good. Her husband because her memory in every case has been wiped either uh, out of mercy because the experience was so traumatic or out of malevolence because they were abducted by the bad guys and they wanted to erase the evidence the things that she has actually witnessed herself have been incredibly mundane I'll give you an example she tells a story about going out into the backyard and seeing three triangular depressions in the ground indicating that uh, a heavy craft possibly has landed in the backyard. And she goes running into the house and grabs Corey and says, look, come and look at this. Uh, look at these depressions in the ground. What, what, what is this? And then Corey informs her, oh, right. Yes, last night I was abducted by the military industrial complex secret space program. They filled me full of drugs and interrogated me for hours before bringing me back and landing their spacecraft back in the backyard. And, and I just uh, kind of went, went to bed. Uh, I was going to mention it. Uh, some people are highly suggestible. I've met them. And uh, it's hard to put yourself in their place when you can't imagine yourself being that susceptible. Throughout the interview, Stacy Good offers no corroboration whatsoever, but uh, turns out to be just another echo point giving Corey's story seeming legitimacy. Over the last few months, a number of 
people have come out to challenge the Corey Good movement, the sphere being alliance paradigm, as it has begun to grow exponentially. And one of these critics is a gentleman who calls himself the dark journalist. I just wanted to bring up the dark journalist because he has leveled some very valid criticisms of Corey Good. The fact that this looks like a cynical marketing campaign, it appears to be targeted at vulnerable type people. It does not uh, jive with the basic concepts of, of evidence and journalistic research. These are all valid criticisms, and the dark journalist has done some interesting interviews, but I just want to point out that he has also engaged in some very unjournalistic tactics in his uh, pursuit of Corey Good, one of which was to take uh, a former Corey's kid who had just been kind of uh, excluded from an, a meeting of the inner circle, and there may also have been issues of, uh, of, of jealousy involving another Corey's kid and a relationship. In any case, this very jaded individual was brought on uh, to the Dark Journalist's channel on YouTube and interviewed, and it's from this guy that a lot of the uh, charges of Satanism have emerged. It was pretty clear to me watching the interview that this gentleman, uh, the Dark Journalist was interviewing, was jaded, angry, in a dark place, and looking to lash out and hurt not just Corey Good, but his former Corey's kids' friends. And so I would just caution, one of the things we don't want to do as we expose the the real damage that this Corey Good movement is, is doing to uh, ufology is to engage in dishonest or unjournalistic tactics like that. Uh, you got to make sure that the person that you're talking to is someone who doesn't have a motive to say some things uh, that might uh, smear the person that you are seeking to expose. One of the interesting points raised uh, is that Corey Good's choice for illustrator appears to have been involved at some point with Satanism, or at least ha have been involved in, in a satanic heavy metal band. And one of the things that's given as evidence of this is the fact that in his illustration of the uh, Blue Avian, the Blue Avian appears to be standing there throwing up some kind of satanic uh, gang sign. But overall, this Satanism stuff strikes me as a distraction. I should probably stop here and answer the question anyone who has not previously been familiar with this information would be asking right now which is, why wouldn't Corey simply record one of his many transportations or teleportations or abductions that are ongoing, which he reports to David Wilcock on a regular basis? Well, his answer is not particularly surprising, that to procure evidence of his involvement with these various aliens, or even the secret space program, would violate the dogma and doctrine of the law of one, which has as its prime directive non-interference, and not interfering means not interfering with free will. But lo and behold, these various alien races are permitted to communicate using Corey Good as a conduit, because Corey is a special case, someone who's already been brought into the Middle Earth in space by those evil reptilians and their evil henchmen via his 20 and back excursions. How very convenient this is for everyone involved. So let me make this clear. Corey is telling those who want to believe his story that they aren't going to get any actual evidence from him. He implores his loyal following to essentially have faith in him and stay the course as laid out by the doctrine of the law of one, a universal religion that trumps all others. If they do this, they will all find salvation through ascension. In every case, Corey Good is the central figure around which all of these ideas pivot. Everything in Corey's described world depends on whether or not he can convince the global human community to put their faith in him and his message. So how come I know so much about what Corey Good has revealed on the Cosmic Disclosure television program? Well, like many people, I watched initially because it was something new, so why not check it out? And also because it used a lot of Dolan's terminology, 
which made it seem like it could have some grounding and plausibility. However, I quickly grew irritated with David Wilcock's idea of correlation, his constant references to his synchronicities, and his frequent thumping of the law of one book, not to mention his ridiculous assertion that everyone has a service to others power meter that must reach a certain percentage if we'd all like to go to heaven. It's one of the more childish interpretations of the golden rule I've ever heard. But I kept watching with renewed interest after the introduction of the Inner Earth and Shar people. You know, those ancestors of humankind that have ascended to fourth density and consist of various castes, a priest caste, a science caste, a worker caste, uh, administrative caste, people who are very peaceful and live blissful lives. And I forgot to mention before that they place a high value on virginity. They live a very long time and they drive around in cigar-shaped anti-gravity craft. Those people. Well, I've been waiting impatiently for Corey to announce that the Anshar have revealed to him that they are not ancestors of human beings from the past, but descendants of human beings from the future who have come back to help us secure the timeline and shepherd us into our ascension. For over a year, I have strongly suspected that Corey would switch up this detail, that he would change the Anshar from human ancestors to human descendants. And the reason why I've had this very strong prediction is because I'm familiar with a book called Chronicles from the Future, Valley of the Roses. In 1921, a man named Paul Amadeus Dianek, a Swiss-Australian teacher with fragile health, fell into a coma, a year-long coma. And during this time, he reported that his consciousness slid into the future and entered the body of another man. And the date was 3906 AD. Now, the society he describes in this future time is identical to the Anshar, identical in pretty much every way. They have the same caste system. They place a very high value on virginity. They live long, peaceful, and very blissful lives. And they fly around in cigar-shaped anti-gravity craft. Even the clothing used in the illustrations for the translated version of Mr. Dianek's diary slash book are almost identical to illustrations that Corey has had commissioned of his Mayans. Now, I want to clarify that I don't, I'm not saying that I believe that Mr. Paul Amadeus Dianek went into the future, that his consciousness was projected into the future. In fact, there's a very good argument that what he experienced was some kind of coma-induced lucid dream state. A lot of the details seem to suggest that before he went into the coma, he had recently lost the love of his life to an illness. And while he was in the coma, when he went into the future, who did he meet in the future? Well, the reincarnation of his lost love, where he spent a year with her before uh, waking up from the coma, his consciousness having been transported back to his original starting point. But the interesting thing about the book is the way it describes future technology is not your typical 1920s vision of the future. It's not all cogs and metal and wheels and people being propelled along sidewalks by conveyor belts. It's actually plausible technology that could be extrapolated from what we have today, including holographic like iPad technology, uh, the anti-gravity craft I mentioned, the abundance of resources, uh, there's telepathy, just as with the Anshar, and uh, many other details that one could imagine in some science fiction movie being presented as our future, and people would not balk at it, they would not find it particularly unbelievable, because uh, it seems to extend naturally as a projection of our current technology, minus, of course, the telepathy stuff. But the reason that I knew that Corey Good would eventually reveal that the Anshar were human descendants and not human ancestors was because I've already read the book. And I suppose Corey felt, or whoever's been feeding Corey this information, that it would be too obvious that this detail had been drawn from a book that was only translated into English in 2013 if the Anshar were presented as human descendants. So there had to be some kind of twist so they were presented as human ancestors. And now with this shift, I have very little doubt that both Corey and David will claim 
that the Chronicles from the Future Valley of the Roses book is another amazing correlation when all it really is is an indication that more detail of Corey's story has been lifted from existing sources. There is an excellent video synopsis of the translated version of the diary slash book on YouTube, and we'll put the link in the description below. The author who translated the book goes into quite a lot of detail about the various aspects of this society, how they get around, and just from watching that video, you can see quite clearly that the details are pretty much identical to Corey's description of the Anshar. Corresponding roughly with the taping of the Intel update where Corey revealed the Anshar are actually our descendants, David Wilcock essentially dropped off the face of the earth. He didn't provide any updates to his webpage, he made no tweets, and essentially no one heard from him for about a month and a half. Until August 4th when he tweeted that he was working on a personal update to explain why he had gone offline for so long. I'm sure that not very many people realize that David Wilcock's theories about ascension have been largely anchored over the past two years by Corey's description of the Anshar being our ancestors. David, frequently on his sister show on the Gaia Network Wisdom Teachings, will reference Corey Good and say, look, here's proof that past human ancestors have gone through these cycles of ascension and risen to fourth density. And although it's hard to read people during something like a Cosmic Disclosure episode where there's plenty of time for everyone to pull themselves together, I couldn't help but feel that as Corey Good revealed this sudden twist that the Anshar were actually our descendants and not our ancestors, that uh, David had a difficult time not showing the shock on his face. The implications to his ascension theories are obvious. David's ascension theories, which were so heavily anchored by Corey's story about the Anshar, which David very much believed was real, are now rendered somewhat comical by the fact that the anchor that he was using has turned out to have been a complete fabrication, as admitted by his source. Now, this is the embarrassing thing that can happen to somebody when they fall into the trap of confirmation bias and accepting people's stories as though they are evidence. And for the Cosmic Disclosure series, there was on July 11th an episode of Question and Answers, which is filler, really. And then the following week's episode featured Pete Peterson with Corey's name taken off the title for that episode. The following week again featured the other secret space program whistleblower Pete Peterson, again with Corey's name not in the marketing splash for that episode. And this leads me to July 25th when... Teresa Yanaros of Divine Frequency did an interview with Corey Good, where Corey responded to all of the criticisms and the demands for evidence. One of the interesting things that he did was go out of his way to make a point of saying that he is in daily communication with David and that David has his back. But we've only heard that from Corey, and all other evidence suggests a departure between Corey and David. Corey spins it like he was only ever contracted to do 50 episodes of Cosmic Disclosure, despite the fact that he and David are both founders of that program, and that he's going off now to do his own things, and he may return from time to time to provide additional intel updates on Cosmic Disclosure. Let's get into this over two hour long interview where Corey responds to all of the criticism that has been leveled against him. First of all, most of the focus during the interview is understandably on the overreaching charges made by the dark journalist, mainly the Satanism stuff. This is an easy charge to respond to and dismiss because it is based on the flimsiest of evidence, and at least half the interview seems to be spent on the bogus Satanism charge and related topics. 
all of the criticism that's covered during the interview is framed as having come from the dark journalist. And all of the responses Corey makes are basically the same. That all of the criticism leveled against him is a plot by Project Avalon and Bill Ryan to discredit Corey. Again and again, regardless of the criticism or where it originated from, though mostly it's presented as having come from the dark journalist, which is false, the response is that it's a conspiracy by Project Avalon. Corey's focus seems to be completely on the idea that Project Avalon is conspiring against him. With no evidence, he claims they harassed his family so that he had to move. In many of his responses, Corey Good promotes claims against Bill Ryan, the administrator of Project Avalon, that are very character damaging. Good even starts talking about Bill Ryan's marriage and says very personal and defamatory things about Ryan, while admitting his information comes from no one he can identify. I heard so much about Project Avalon that I had to go and check it out myself, and about halfway through making this video, I did so. And the first thing that struck me about these forums was the degree of scrutiny that's applied to people who come on to those forums and make wide-eyed, sensational claims. The administrators there and the other participants will politely but insistently press for evidence. Uh, they don't just accept any story. So what I got from Project Avalon was that they are very skeptical and challenging to people who come with stories but have no evidence to back up their stories. And it became pretty clear to me, based on looking at the Project Avalon forums and then looking at Corey's response to his criticism in this interview, that, and this is my opinion, what Corey dislikes most about Project Avalon is the fact that they weren't willing to just simply believe his story without evidence. Now, during the interview, all of Corey's attacks against Bill Ryan and the claims about the Project Avalon conspiracy against him are delivered with what to me seems like an unhealthy looking expression of relish. At several points, Corey looks directly into the camera as though he's addressing his thousands of followers directly. Corey also implies several times that anyone who challenges him, which I must assume includes those who demand evidence for his claims, is a sociopath or Nazi that is going crazy because our planet is being hit by strange energies from intergalactic space. Corey also says he and his supporters have been bombarded by what he calls energetic attacks from people hiding in closets, sticking pins into voodoo dolls. I'm not making this up. Corey appears to be addressing his diehard followers directly in the manner of a cult leader throughout his responses. Watching the interview, it felt like with Corey Good, we've suddenly moved from what was merely largely silly into genuinely creepy territory. Corey says he's just a regular guy who's been fortunate enough to be filled with love and light from the blue avians and elf-like Anchar, and he only wants to love others and be loved by others. This is also the standard line given by most modern cult leaders. I'm not precisely certain how a person who is filled with love and light is supposed to behave, but I am certain what I saw in that interview is definitely not it. And at this point, we really need to talk about news reporting, journalism ethics, and interviewing a subject. Now, Teresa Yanaros calls herself a journalist, and the confusion is understandable. There are full adults living today who have never or hardly been exposed to actual journalism. It's been almost two decades since television journalism discarded anything that remained of its ethical duty for partisan propaganda, and a decade since most major newspapers of any real note followed suit completely. The very definition of a competent journalist is someone who takes their political, religious, and anecdotal bias and compartmentalizes them, pushing them far away from their work, and then focusing on digging, probing, and verifying with the aim of finding out what's actually going on. This is what was drilled into me at Carleton University School of Journalism, from which I graduated with honors in 1999. So Teresa can possibly be forgiven if she has never been exposed to the concepts behind ethical journalism and news reporting. So of course, Teresa doesn't follow the classic interview style of a serious reporter interviewing a controversial source. In fact, most of what Teresa does is not ask pointed questions, but simply present various topics followed by can you comment on that? 
at which point Corey offers a ludicrous or deflective response, and Teresa accepts the answer at face value. During the interview, Teresa asks no real challenging probing or follow-up questions, such as comparing Corey's answers against existing information that would prove he was being incomplete in his response, if not deliberately deceptive. One example is the Lyndon Moulton Howe controversy. At the recent Contact in the Desert event, Linda Moulton Howe's name appeared on posters placed around the event, advertising a new book to be written also by Corey Good and devoted follower Jordan Sather. When this was brought to her attention, Linda sent a message clarifying that she had nothing to do with the book and stating that she didn't understand why her name was associated with it. Teresa raises the topic during the interview and Corey's response is demonstrably misleading. Corey claims that he and Jordan were consulting informally with Linda Howe and her name was accidentally added to a single slide, which he didn't notice until his presentation. Unfortunately, his co-author for the upcoming book, Jordan Sather himself, posted a YouTube video where he complained that his upcoming book with Corey Good wasn't getting the attention it deserved, especially considering the inclusion of big names on the posters advertising it at Contact in the Desert, such as Linda Moulton Howe and how this was apparently evidence of a deliberate conspiracy to suppress Jordan Sather's brand. Uh, but anyway, it's very interesting that they uh, didn't want to say that I was working with all those other names on this project. I mean, Dr. Bob Wood is a physicist that went to Cornell and he worked at Douglas for 34 years. I mean, that's, <laughs> there's a reason that he didn't want to say those other names is because it gives a lot of freaking credence to this project. And also one of the other names that was up on that board mentioned a contact in the desert was none other than Linda Moulton Howe. That guy talks a lot about his brand. But the most important question, really the only one that matters, evidence, is never addressed directly. Teresa touches it lightly when she gives Corey a platform to address the criticism that his story and information have no journalism or research value. Corey's response to this is to throw his hands up and say, what is journalism anyway? Isn't it just listening to someone's story and reporting it to others? Well, I can answer that question and the answer is no, that's not journalism at all. That's what a publicist does. A public relations spokesperson, a media relations agent, that's their job and Teresa appears to be a volunteer publicist for Corey Good. And frankly, I think she should be paid for her work. And she thinks she's a journalist, but like I said, she can be forgiven if there's confusion there. Now, Corey explains that whatever we collectively decide together is real becomes the new reality. He calls it our co-creative capabilities. Essentially, Corey uses new age gibber speak to walk around the reality that his story has no journalistic value, while simultaneously implying that even if it isn't true, we could all make it true if we just all join together and wish hard enough. So the biggest question of all is never really asked directly, the question of evidence. So let's get into the question of where are all of the charges and criticism and demand for evidence coming from? Well, I can tell you they're definitely not all coming from the dark journalist. He's the guy who's been aggregating all of the charges and criticisms against Corey, most predominantly put out in front as the lead. And in this video, I have clearly called him out for creating this stupid Satanism distraction by using a bad source and flimsy evidence. I've skimmed through the Dark Journalist catalog, however, to make this video and watching some of his interviews and skimming others. And although I would employ a less egocentric style, and maybe that's required to make a career out of journalism and ufology, I don't know, his interviews are pretty well done. He really explores as much as he can with an interview subject and he knows how to interject interesting angles into the discussion. But besides the dark journalist and the various parties he's interviewed about Corey Good, we've also heard from Linda Howe regarding unauthorized use of her name for apparent cynical marketing purposes. And Richard Dolan has also interviewed Bill Ryan on the specific topic of so-called SSP whistleblowers who come at us with wide-eyed tales and zero evidence. Now, Dolan and Ryan appear to be in complete agreement that what appears to have happened is that Dolan's well-researched and grounded work on this topic, which offers logical arguments and speculations on the UFO phenomenon based on all available documents, witness testimony, and circumstantial evidence, that this work has been used as a foundation to support a space fantasy cult slash entertainment franchise with Corey Good as a central figure and executive producer. Now, how anyone can look at this and not clearly see it should be mind-blowing, but I guess I'm getting old and I'm not so surprised anymore. 
This observation uh, that Corey's story is nothing more than a giant shit show is being made by people both within and completely outside of ufology. In fact, Richard Dolan has been warning about this for years. Go watch an interview Dolan did with the Dark Journalist back in 2013, long before anyone knew of a Corey Good. It's on YouTube. And in it, they discuss the growing issue of esoteric New Age religious influences on ufology and how they risk disrupting and invalidating the rational work of ufology in much the same way the 1960s peace movement, which was based on strong rational arguments, seemed to have been co-opted and neutralized by hippie drug culture. In the interview, Dolan explicitly laments that many people are increasingly appearing on the scene strongly advocating that everyone should just stare at their navels and think loving thoughts, and together we'll all magically create a reality where full disclosure occurs and utopia follows. You know, I saw a recent panel discussion at Contact in the Desert that consisted of Richard Dolan and then about seven other people, all of whom seem to be completely subsumed into this esoteric, spiritual horseshit that has absolutely no interest in actual evidence, but seems to propel itself along based on a modern New Age dogma. We still have to confront evil. Yeah. We still have to deal with it. That's the thing. And um, I, I agree with Victoria that we our, our way of thinking, our minds, do create the kinds of individuals that we will be. Uh, the way we think about ourselves is critically important. I'm just saying there's a there's a danger and I think really we have to be aware of this if we're going to be honest with ourselves which is that um, there you know we can we can think all we want about raising our frequency but there's still going to be 80 people in this world who are going to try to buy up everything that's worth owning they're still going to try to keep us as a slave race well, and we have to do something about that. So these are the lion beings, you said? Lion? They're feline beings. And they, feline. like Sekhmet and Narisha and in India, they were the protectors of the gods. They've been around forever and now they're back. Okay. And they're here to protect the forgotten gods, which is you, if you want to attune to them. So we'll go ahead and play this. Uh... Of course, being loving and trying to dampen down your selfishness is a very good idea. But if you want to really serve others, there are very real problems being caused by very evil people on this planet who are going to have to be fought with something more than loving thoughts. Holding hands and singing songs will not defeat them. And the way this kind of irrational, emotional, and in my opinion, deeply selfish so-called spiritual movement is spreading over ufology like a sticky paste looks to me like a move to kill the field by taking advantage of well-meaning dupes who are much more open and needful than they are responsible and discerning. So why did I make this video? Because I can tell you I'm definitely not being paid, that's for sure. I don't have a career as a UFO journalist. I'm not a friend or acquaintance of Bill Ryan or the Dark Journalist or Richard Dolan or anyone involved. I've made this video, which was more than a little work, now, granted, in terms of production value, I don't have the Gaia Studios or any studio or a proper microphone or a professional illustrator or a slick website or even a pair of dark shades. But the reason I put the effort into this is because I'm irritated to see the effect the good movement is having on ufology, which it appears to be setting up to burn at the stake. I am obviously interested in this field, but like Kyle, my orientation is that the best way to serve the field of ufology is to be brutally skeptical of all claims, anything being presented as evidence, people's testimony, to be open-minded but also very scrupulous in my scrutiny, especially when people come at ufology with individualized, self-centered tales of adventure and tragedy for which there is no witness testimony and no evidence. I approach the subject and individual claims like a trained and ethical journalist would approach any other topic area. I've had my own odd experience seeing something flying in the sky that I could not identify and which I could never explain to my own satisfaction. But this was a personal experience that I had while alone and not evidence of anything concrete or specific. To this day I haven't come to a conclusion about what it was. 
That's what the U is about in the acronym UFO or UAP, the things unidentified. We try to figure out what it might be. As long as it remains a UFO or a UAP, that means by definition that it has not been identified. Substantive research within the field of ufology is about looking at cases and whatever exists as possible evidence in executing a strategy of deduction based on a combination of probability and plausibility. One of the things you have to face about ufology is that, to this date, the amount of interesting physical evidence that is publicly verifiable and possibly indicative of the alien and visitation hypothesis would fit into a large trunk, if even that. The only way any of us are going to extract anything of value out of this field, and the prize could very well be something that changes the entire world, is to be strictly disciplined in our discernment and in our judgment. That means not blindly believing an ex-copy machine maintenance guy who says wise aliens have sent him here to bring us salvation by telling us to love one another. There have been other cults like that, pretty recently actually, and they ended very badly. And with that said, I think now is a good time to speculate a little bit on what might exactly be going on with Corey Good. Is he just a nasty, calculating, pathological liar? Well, let's explore that for a second. One of the things that's kind of held up as a proof that Corey is being genuine is the fact that many people, including myself uh, and body language experts, do not get an overwhelming sense of deception from him by the way he presents himself and uh, communicates his information. Now, I, I would like to note that um, all you need to do to become a body language expert is uh, the following. I'm a body language expert. There, I'm now qualified. And that is to say that there is no qualification to be a body language expert. That said, it doesn't mean body language analysis is not useful if it's done by somebody who has some skill in that art. It's just not a science, <clears throat> okay? So it's important to note that a, a genuinely capable and accomplished sociopath is capable of fooling body language experts, is capable of fooling even uh, very critically minded people, people who are pretty good at picking up on signs of BS, uh, and they are even capable of fooling uh, a lie detector test quite convincingly. So I guess the simplest and most obvious explanation would be that Corey Good is uh, some kind of high level narcissistic sociopath who has gotten through most of his life sort of putting on a show or, or, or feigning expertise and this or that uh, until he discovered uh, the best possible con he could have discovered, which was this entire story that he's invented. So that's obviously option number one. It's the simplest possibility. It's certainly the option that the dark journalist uh, likes to put forth. But, you know, uh, I was talking about this with Kyle, and there's a kind of more nuanced interpretation of Corey Good. It could really be this. Some people have the ability to self-hypnotize. That is to say, um, make themselves truly and genuinely believe uh, something uh, that is, is not based in reality. A perfect example of someone who does this for a living quite legitimately would be a, a very accomplished method actor. Famous examples include Philip Seymour Hoffman and Heath Ledger. These, these actors essentially convince themselves that they are another person with a unique set of different life experiences and when they perform in a film or on stage, they do everything they can do to truly believe that they are the person they are portraying. So uh, Corey may be an example of someone who is doing this. He may have hypnotized himself in a way similar to method acting where he genuinely believes what he is saying is real. Now it's hard to uh, reconcile that with the ongoing uh, interactions with the alien beings, but perhaps Corey has vivid dreams and he kind of mixes it all together and convinces himself he's had a powwow with a uh, you know eight foot tall autistic blue bird men from outer space a method actor knows somewhere inside uh, as we all know as as audience members that it is a performance you know so if this is what's happened with jimmy good uh, the two main things to note are that he isn't confessing to giving a performance nor does he appear to break character which would put this uh, explanation squarely in the realm of a self-induced delusion. And now for the more conspiratorially minded. And yeah, I'm looking at you, Sean M. 
Uh, <laughs> you know, some note that Corey's stated memories of his suspected involvement in a secret government program uh, were very fuzzy and vague until he went to have surgery for a detached retina. Apparently, there were severe complications during that surgery. Apparently, he spent four times longer than normal in that surgery. And according to his wife, the vividness of his secret space program memories and all of the 20 and back programs he says he participated in came flooding in after he came out of that surgery. And in fact, according to his wife, the memories were so intense and disturbing that Corey had something of a mental breakdown. So for you uh, conspiracy buffs out there, uh, a more interesting yet less likely answer in my opinion is that Corey is the unwitting victim of an ongoing government mind control and disinformation campaign. Uh, as in, uh, they clockwork oranged his ass while he laid on the surgery table. Uh, one thing is for sure, anyone watching this must have their incredulity dial set to zero if they do not recognize that what appears to be forming around Corey bears all the hallmarks of a cult. In the end here, my advice for anyone who's looking at this and maybe having second thoughts or may just be shaking their head wondering, what is all this? It seems awfully complicated. Well, my advice is not to get bogged down in all these weeds. Don't worry about the Satanism stuff. Don't obsess over whether Chronicles from the Future is something that Corey read or something that someone else read and then fed details to him or another amazing correlation. You can tell that this whole thing is a shit show and that those weeds are designed to distract you from the only thing that really matters, which is this. By his own admission, Corey has had ample opportunity to record and or acquire evidence proving his story is true. Does he have said evidence? No. And why does he not have it? Because it goes against his religion, which also happens to be the religion he's identified as having been written and recommended by the aliens who sent him. It's that simple. And now you know what Corey Good is, which is incredibly ironic when you consider Corey's prime directive, which was to not start a cult. Don't be a cult leader. Don't be a cult leader. To the left, it's your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network, KTRA, the Global Radio Alliance. A year out to the year 1985. You're listening to Fight to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. 